Hello, everyone. Welcome to Special Cube Conversation here in the Cube Studio in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media and also the co-host of the Cube. We're here with Junaid Islam, who's the president and CTO of a company called Vidder. Also supports the public sector and the defense community. Teaches a class on cyber and, uh, intelligence and cyber warfare. Junaid, thank you for coming in. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. I'll see. You know, we've been doing a lot of coverage of cyber in context to one, the global landscape, obviously, yeah. uh, in our area of enterprise and emerging tech. You see, the enterprises are all, you know, shaking in their boots but you now have new tools like IOT, which increases the surface area of attacks. You're seeing AI being weaponized for, for bad actors. But in general, it's just a really a mess right now. Yeah. And security is changing. So I'd like to get your thoughts on it, and also talk about you know, some of the implications around the, the, the cyber warfare that's going on. Certainly the elections on everyone's mind, you see fake news but really it's a complete new generational shift that's happening. With all the good stuff going on, blockchain and everything else, and AI, he's also bad actors. You know, fake news is not just fake mm -hmm. content, there's an underlying infrastructure, critical infrastructure, involved. Yeah, you're 100% you're right, and I think what you have hinted on is something that is only now people are getting awareness of, is that is, as America becomes a more connected society, we become more vulnerable to cyber attacks. For the past few years, really cyber attacks were driven by people looking to make 20 bucks or whatever, but now you really have state actors uh, moving into the uh, cyber attack business and actually subsidizing attackers with free information and hoping to make them more lethal uh, attackers against the United States. And this really is completely new territory. Uh, when we think about cyber threats, almost all of the existing models don't capture the risks involved here. And it affects every American. Everybody should be worried about what's going on. And certainly the landscape has changed uh, in security and tech with the cloud computing. But more importantly, we have Trump in the office and there's all this the brouhaha over just that in itself. But in concert to that, you're seeing the Russians, we're seeing them involved in the election. You're seeing you know, China mm -hmm. uh, putting you know, blocks and everything and changing how the rules are gained. It's a whole global economy. So I got to ask you the question that's on everyone's mind is, um, cyber war is real. We do not have a West Point Navy SEALs for cyber yet. I know there's some stuff at Berkeley that's pretty interesting to me, uh, that Michael Grimes at Morgan Stanley is involved in, amongst other folks as well, where a new generation of attacks is happening yeah. in the US of A right now. Could you comment and share your thoughts and reaction to what's happening now that's different in the U.S. from a cyber attack standpoint, and why the government is trying to move quickly, why companies are moving quickly, what's different now, why is the attacks so rampant, what's changed? I think the uh, biggest difference we have now is what I would call direct state sponsorship of cyber attack tools. A great example of that is the Vault 7 disclosure on WikiLeaks. Typically, uh, when you've had intelligence agencies steal one thing from another country, they would keep it a secret and basically use those vulnerabilities during a time of an attack or a different operation. In this case, we saw something completely different. Uh, we, we think the Russians might have stolen, but we don't know. But whoever stole it immediately puts it back into the public domain. And why do they do that? They want those vulnerabilities to be known by as many attackers as possible, who then in turn will attack the United States at across not only uh, public sector organizations, but as private. And one of the interesting outcomes you've seen is the uh, malware attacks or the cyber attacks we saw these this year were much more lethal than ever before. If you look at the WannaCry attack and then the NotPetya attack, NotPetya attack started with the Russians attacking the Ukraine, but because of the way they did the attack, they basically created malware that moved by itself. Within three days, computers in China that were 20 companies away from the original target were losing their data. And this level of lethality we've never seen. And it is a direct result of these uh, state actors moving into the cyber warfare domain, creating weapons that basically spread through the internet at very high velocity. And the reason this is so concerning for the United States is we are a truly connected society. All American companies have supply chain partners. All American companies have people uh, working in Asia. Uh, so we can't undo this. And what we've got to do very quickly 
is develop countermeasures against this. Uh, otherwise, the uh, impacts will just get worse and worse. So the old days, if I get this right, hey, I attack you, I get the secret oh, back door to the US, and spy on spy kind of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So now you're saying is there's a force multiplier out That's there right. with the crowd. So they're essentially democratizing the tools, not, we used to call it kitty scripts. Yeah. Now they're not, not kitty scripts anymore. They're real weapons of cyber weaponry that's open to people who want to attack or motivated to attack the U.S. Is that kind of, am I getting that right? That, that's right, I mean, if you look at what happened in WannaCry, you had people looking for $200 uh, payout, but they were using tools that could have easily wiped out a country. Now, the reason this works for America's um, enemies, as it were, or adversaries, is in the short run, they get to test out weapons. In the, in the long run, they're really learning about how these attacks propagated, and you know, make no mistake, if there's a political in event uh, and it's, it's in their interest to be able to shut down U.S. computers, uh, it, it, you, it's just something I think we need to worry about and be very conscious of, of specifically these yeah. new type of attack vectors. Not to put my fear mongering hat on because you know, as, a, as a computer scientist myself, back, back in the day, I can only imagine how interesting this is to attack the United States. What is the government doing? What's the conversations that you're hearing? What are some of the things going on in the industry around, okay, this, we're seeing something so sophisticated, so orchestrated, at many levels, you know, state actors democratizing the tools for the, the bad guys, if you will, but we've seen fraud and uh, cyber theft be highly mafia driven or sophisticated groups of organized, you know, under the mm -hmm. <laughs> black market companies. Forms of, I mean, really well funded, well staffed. I mean, so the HBO hack just a couple weeks ago, I mean, shaking them down with ransomware. Again, there's many, many different things. This has got to scare the, the, uh, the, the cyber security forces of the United States. What are they doing? So I, I think, uh, <clears throat> well, one thing I think uh, Americans should feel happy about is within the defense and intelligence community, uh, this has become one of the top priorities. So they are uh, implementing uh, a huge set of uh, resources and programs to mitigate this. Unfortunately, you, you know, they, will, they need to take care of themselves first. I think it's still up to uh, enterprises to secure their own systems against these new types of attacks. I mean, I think we can uh, certainly get direction from the U.S. government. And they've already begun uh, outreach programs, for example, the FBI actually has a cyber security branch, and they actually assign officers to uh, American companies who are targets. And typically, that's that's actually I think started last year. Yeah. But they, they'll actually come meet you ahead of the attack and introduce themselves. So that's actually pretty good, and uh, that that's a fantastic program. I, I know some of the people there, but you still have to become aware. You still have to look at the big risks in your company and figure out how yeah. to pr protect them. That is something that no law enforcement person can help you at because that has to be proactive. You know, we, you know everyone who watches my um, Silicon Valley podcast knows that I've been very much, talk a lot about Trump, um, and no one knows if I voted for him or not. Or, actually didn't vote for him, but that's a different point. We've been critical of Trump, but also at the same time, you know, the whole wall thing is kind of funny in and of itself, mm -hmm. I mean, building walls is ridiculous. But let's take that to the firewall problem, yeah. right? So let's talk about tech. The old days, you have a firewall, right? The United States really has no firewall because the perimeters or the borders, if you will, are not clear. So in, in, the, in the industry, they call it perimeterless. There's no more f moat, there's no more front doors. There's a lot of access points into networks and companies. Um, this is changing the security paradigm, not only at the government level, but the companies <clears throat> who are creating value, but also losing money on these attacks. Yeah. So what is the security paradigm today? Is it, is it people putting their head in the sand? Are there new approaches? Well, is yeah, it a do-over? Is yeah. there a reset? Security is the number one thing. So what I, are companies I, and governments doing? So I, I think, uh, well, well, first of all, there's a lot of thinking going on, but I, I think there's two things that need to happen. I think one, we certainly need new policies and laws. I think just on the legal side, uh, whether you, if you look at the most recent Equifax breach, we need to update laws on people holding assets that they need to become liable. We also need more policies that people need to 
lock down national uh, critical infrastructure like power systems. And then the third thing is the technical aspect. I'd bring it, we actually, in the United States, actually do have technologies that are countermeasures to all of these attacks and we need to bring those online. And I, I think as daunting as it looks like protecting the country, actually it's a solvable problem. For example, there's been a lot of press that you know foreign governments are scanning uh, U.S. power infrastructure. And you know, from my perspective as a humble networking person, I've always wondered why do we allow basically connectivity from outside the United States to power plants which are inside the United States. I mean, uh, you could easily you know, filter those at the peering points. And, and I know some people might say that's controversial. Uh, you know, are, are we going to yeah. spy on And the ports too, like yeah. you know, ports of New Orleans. I was talking to the CTO there, he's saying yeah. Maritimes are accessing the core network. Yeah, so you know, from my perspective as a technical, I'm not a politician. <laughs> uh, but that's I, good. Thank I, God. I, 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 I we need more of you out there. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I, and I've worked on this problem a little bit. I, I would certainly block inbound flows from outside the United States to critical infrastructure. There is no uh, value or uh, reason, logical reason, you would give of why someone from an uh, external country uh, should be allowed to scan a U.S. asset. And th that is uh, technically quite simple for us to do. Uh, it is something that I and others have talked about, you know, uh, publicly and privately. Uh, I, I think that's a very simple step we could do. Another very simple step we could do uh, across the board is basically authenticated access. That is, uh, if you are accessing a U.S. government website, uh, you need to sign in and there will be an MFA step up. And I think this makes sense. What's an MFA step up? Well, like some kind of secondary. So okay, say it. you're accessing the IRS portal and you want to just check on something, uh, you know, that you're going to sign in and we're going to send a message to your phone to make sure you are you. I know a lot of people will feel, hey, this is an invasion of privacy, but you know, I I'll tell you what's an invasion of privacy someone stealing 140 million IDs or, or your backgrounds and, yeah. and having everything. That's yeah, a, which that's just a, happened. That's a bigger. So MFA multi. Uh, yeah, that's right, factor, uh, yeah. Factor authentication yeah. guy. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, again. Unless the, they hack your cell phone, which the Bitcoin guys have already done. Yeah. But it, so it's, e it's easy for hackers to hack one system. It's hard for hackers to hack multiple systems. So I, th I think at the, at the national security level, uh, there are a number of simple things we can do that are actually not expensive. Uh, that I think we as a society have been, have to really think about doing. Uh, because having uh, uh, really uh, governments which are very uh, anti-American, uh, destabilizing us by taking all of our data out uh, doesn't really help anyone. So th that's the biggest loss. And it's a, there's no risk for the destabilizing America enemies out there. They. What's the disincentive? They're going to get put in jail. There's no real enforcement. I mean, if yeah, so, cyber so, is a great leverage. So, so one them. of the uh, things that I think most people don't understand is the international laws on cyber attacks are, just don't exist anymore. Uh, they have a long way to catch up. Uh, let me give a counter example, which is drugs. Uh, there are already uh, multilateral agreements on uh, chasing drug traffickers as they go from country to country. And there's a number of institutions that monitor that, enforce that. That actually you know, works quite well. We also have new groups uh, focusing on human trafficking. You know, it's slowly happening. But in the area of cyber, we haven't even started a legal framework on what would constitute a cyber attack. And, this, and sadly, one of the reasons it's not happening is America's enemies don't want it to happen. But this is where I think as a nation, first you have to take care of yourself, and then on a multilateral perspective, the U.S. should start uh, pushing a uh, cybersecurity framework worldwide so that mm -hmm. if uh, you start getting uh, emails from that friendly prince, who's actually a friend of mine, about you know, putting in some, you know, we, we can actually go back to that country and <laughs> say, hey, you know, we, you know, we don't want to send you any more money anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everyone's going to make $18 million. They give up their username, password, social security yeah. number. All right, final question on, on the segment around you know, the, the cybersecurity piece. Um, 
What's the action going forward? I'll say it's early days and, and hardcore days right now. It's really uh, the underbelly of the internet globally mm -hmm. is attacking, we see that. Um, the government is, doesn't have a legal, legal framework yet in place, they need to do that. But there's a lot of momentum around creating a Navy SEALs, you know, the version of land, air, and sea, or multidisciplinary combat. Yeah. Um, efforts out there. There's been conversations certainly in, in some of our networks that we talk about. Um, what's the young generation? I mean, you've got a lot of gamers out there that would love to be part of a new game, if you will, called cyber um, defense. What's going on? I mean, what, is there any vision around how to train young people? Is there an armed forces concept? Is there something like this happening? What's the next step? What do we need to do as a, as so, a, as so, a government? So you've actually touched on a very difficult issue because if you think about security, uh, in the United States, it's really been driven by a compliance model, which is here's this set of things to memorize and this is what you do to become secure. And all of our cybersecurity training courses are based on models. If there's one thing we've learned about cyber attackers is these people are creative and do something new every time and go around the model. So I think one of the most difficult things is actually to develop training courses that almost don't have any boundaries because the attackers don't confine themselves to a set of attack vectors, yet we in our training do. We say, well, this is what you need to do. And time and time again, people just do something that's completely different. So that's one thing we have to understand. The other thing we have to understand, which is related to that, is that uh, all of US's cybersecurity plans uh, are public in conferences. Uh, all of our universities are open. So we actually have, uh, there's been- The playbook is out there. We actually, so one of the things that does happen is if you go to any large security conference, you see a lot of people from the countries that are attacking us showing up everywhere, actually going to the same university, going to universities and learning the course. So I think there's two things. One, we, we really need to think deeper about just how attacks are being done, which are unbounded. And two, which is going to be a little bit more difficult, we have to rethink uh, how we share information on a worldwide basis of our solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> probably not the easy answer you wanted, but well, I, mean, it's I, I, I think- well, it's I think, complex and it yeah. requires unstructured thinking that's not tied up, I mean, it's like yeah. the classic, you know, the frog in boiling water dies and you put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out. We are in this false sense of security with these rules, thinking yeah. we're secure, and we're bitten, people are killing us with this, this Yeah, and, and, I mean, and, like, and like I say, it's even worse when we figure out a solution. The first thing we do is we tell everybody, including our enemies, giving them a, a lot of chance to yeah. uh, figure out how to attack us. So I, I think, you know, we, we do have some hard challenges. So don't telegraph, don't be so open, be, be somewhat secretive in, in a way, it's, it's actually I, helpful. I, I think sadly, I, I, I think we've come to the uh, very unfortunate position now where I think we need to, especially in the area of cyber, re rethink our strategies because as an open society, uh, we just love telling everybody what we do. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, so the final so, question, final, final question is just for the, to end this, again, this, end this segment. So cybersecurity is real or not real? I mean, how real is this? Can you just share some color for the folks watching who might say, hey, you know, I want, you know, I think it's all smoke and mirrors. I don't believe the New York Times. I don't believe this. And Trump's saying this. And is this real problem? And how big is it? I think it is real. I think we have this calendar year, uh, 2017, we have moved from the classic, you know, kind of like cyber attack, you know, like someone's being fished for, to really uh, the beginning of a cyber warfare. And unlike kinetic warfare where somebody blows something up, this is a new phase that's long and drawn out. And I think one of the things that makes us very vulnerable as a society is we are an open society. We, we are interlinked with every other global economy. And I, I think we have to think about this seriously because unfortunately there's a lot of people who don't want to see America succeed. They're just like that, uh, even though we're nice people. Yeah. But, uh, so it, it's, it's pretty important. It requires some harmony, it requires some data sharing. Uh, Junaid Zalan, President and CTO of Vidder, talking about the cyber security, cyber warfare dynamic that's happening, it's real, it's dangerous, and our country and other countries need to get their act together. Certainly, I think a 
digital West Point, a digital Navy SEALs needs to happen, and uh, I think there's a great opportunity for us to kind of do some good here and keep an open society while maintaining security. Junaid, thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here in Palo Alto. Thanks for watching. <laughs>